All right, Zig, coming in on the top ten on the show, we have Darwin Miner, singer, songwriter, multi instrumentalist extraordinaire, and the third member of the Night Crickets. So, the last two weeks, we've talked to each member of the Night Crickets, which is a supergroup composed of David J. of Bauhaus, Victor DeLorenzo of the Violent Femmes, and Darwin Miners. Darwin finds himself in the League of Legends here on this record, and it's really cool to hear his perspective because... Um, Bauhaus and Violent Femmes are music that touched his musical upbringing. And to be working with them now on a level as as high as this project is, is really, really profound. And the insight he sheds on this record and his personal like excitement for it is a really cool perspective to hear and is infectious. It's, in, it's exciting to be fanatic and, and ex- a fan of people you work with. This uh this interview was a throwback to the uh, original Zig at the Gig form, meaning I recorded it out of my van on way or right before a gig. Right. So uh, if you're new to this podcast, I play in a band called C Level Letter C Dash Level. We are a funk punk reggae rock group based out of Cleveland, Ohio. We take a lot of open tuned uh, twelve string guitars that are acoustic, and we run them through Marshall amps. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, you might want to check us out. Um, but who? So I'm a actually this was a nursing home gig. So I'm um, doing this interview out of my van in front of a nursing home <laughs> before uh, going in and rocking out with those guys, um, talking with Darwin, and um, yeah. So this is wrapping up our third part series of the Night Crickets. We're gonna listen to a tune. Um, this is one of my personal favorites, the Unreliable Narrator off a of Free Society, the Night Crickets. The unreliable. If you do. The Unreliable Narrator. A Free Society's album and the band's Night Crickets. If you haven't yet, check out uh, episodes one and two of our Night Cricket series with David J. and Victor DeLorenzo. Um, both very, for myself, very exciting interviews because I'm huge fans of both of their bands. Um, and this was a really cool project to get to dive into and hear them in a new light in a way that I never thought I would ever hear. I never thought you, the, the cross of Bauhaus and the violent femmes, right? That, that doesn't even compute. Anyway, so as we're wrapping this up, we're going to get into our interview with Darwin. If you guys can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on one of the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool people and sharing their insights with you. So without further ado, here's my uh, conversation with Darwin Miners. Very cool. Well, um, so diving into uh, diving into this record and all these different aspects of it, I really couldn't yeah. find out too much about your uh, musical like background. So I wanted to kind of pick your brain on that to start us off. Like, sure. was music in the family? Uh, it was in the family in the sense that uh, it was listened to. Yeah. Um, you know, my parents were pretty young when they had me, so it was, uh, you know, I think my mom was 18. Okay. Yeah, my mom was 18, and my dad was 20, I believe. So they, they were, you know, I was I was around them when they were teenagers, or at least my mom was. And so my house was very much filled with the music of that era. So it was a lot of, a lot of the Beatles and Bob Dylan and, you know, James Taylor and, and you know, just that kind of that era. And so it was always on. And a lot of the people that my parents hung out with were musicians and they were all kind of hippies and sat around listening to records and stuff. So I was, I was always around it. And then uh, when I was in fourth grade, I took a, uh, there's a music um, class. That was when they like had a full band in school and I took saxophone. And so I learned that was my first instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And I did that for a couple of years and then, I always tell people like there were there weren't there weren't any people uh, that you'd want to put on your wall that were like saxophone players, you know. <laughs> you would there wasn't like a guy like you put up on the wall, but there were tons of guitarists and singers and stuff. So I just started listening to music more, and the more I started getting into it, the more I just kept getting drawn to the the bass guitar. And so that's really where I started was probably when I was in high school, just playing in you know, just playing around in bands on bass guitar. So that switch, cause saxophone is really like, 
you really focus on your breathing. You're you you you're yeah. thinking in a whole different way than like playing guitar, and like which I think it's a great like uh, I because I started with guitar, but like it's I think it's like a great step towards being able to sing and like write your own songs and kind of like knowing how the voice works a little bit. Um, when you're messing around with bass. And, and and you're getting that that kind of insight too with all the structure of music. At that point, were you just playing like covers, or were you working on your own music? It's interesting because I I would I never I never did covers. I yeah. I did I did do um, what I was able to do was uh, just learn other people's stuff. So ironically, one of them was David J. Yeah, uh, but. <laughs> So I would sit in my room and sort of like, okay, you know, listen to She's in Parties and do no, 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 no. And I would try, you know, I'd cop, I'd learn that. And so he was one of the people that I learned from. Uh, and, and Paul McCartney mm. certainly was the, was the number one guy that I learned, that I just learned his bass lines. And, and then, um, you know, uh, Peter Hook and, and, and uh, The Who and The Cure and these kind of more melodic bass lines I started getting drawn to. And so I just started kind of doing that and, and it it never ever occurred to me and, and maybe it was the scene that I was in, but it wasn't cool to do covers and you know, no one did covers. <laughs> if you did, you could kind of sneak one song into your set, but you never it was like frowned upon to go around and play a bunch of cover songs. So I just never I never wanted to do it. I never did it. But then later on in life, I really wish I had because you learn a lot by covering people, you know, you learn how they write and you learn how they do things and you, you can actually really expand upon your, your playing. But for whatever reason, uh, back then I had no interest at all in it. That, yeah, I, I don't know. It makes sense because like that whole, like when you're first starting to be a ri- trying to be original, you know what I mean? You, you, yeah. You get like, I think about early writing stages and I'd bring songs to the group I was with and they'd be like, Oh, that sounds like this. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. Which is mm-hmm. kind of a, a put down if you've been listening to that artist or whatever they said it sounded like a lot. Right. Uh, you know You're what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> We're not even caught. You just, sometimes you get, you know, you just get so in the tunnel of trying to finish the song and like, uh, and hey, you step back and you're like, oh shit, they're right. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but that's really cool. So the scene that you were, you were kind of growing up in, was it, what type of music was it? Was it like, was it like punk? Was it like, yeah, like a that? lot of yeah? punk. Okay. Yeah, so so I grew up, you know, I, I was you know, I went to high school in the in the the mid to late 80s, so that's kind of my where where you can sort of find me there. Um and in Northern California, so there weren't even though I always preferred, you know, everything sort of was like the Beatles and everyone else. So the Beatles were always my favorite and no one else was even close. And then after that, I was always into the more you know, like I said, The Cure and New Order and Joy Division and Bauhaus and, and and things like that, like that kind of music, more like this dark English type stuff, new wave stuff. Um, but everyone around here was playing punk rock music. So that was kind of the closest. They were still kind of in the same ballpark um, <clears throat> in some ways. And so that was, you know, that was back when you know, Primus was playing, Primus is from the town, like right where I'm at. So they were playing around on a very local, small level and they were sort of new. No one really sounded like them. Um, Green Day was playing for, you know, $5 a show and um, Operation Ivy was playing and, um, you know, bands like that, that, that went on to be, you know, massive. And I used to go see them for five bucks, you know, once a week or once every two weeks. But there never was really a band that kind of did what I really, really liked. That was really the closest thing that was available to me, unless I was to drive to the city, which I couldn't really do uh, until I was 17 and I had a car. (laughs) Right, right. That's awesome, though, to be able to see Green Day and Operation Ivy for five bucks, man. That's sick. Yeah, yeah. And and a great band uh, called Nuisance that was on Lookout, too. They were they were a great band that that really never got their due. Uh, Operation Ivy is one of simply one of the best bands I've ever heard live. And and they never really got I mean, I know they sold a lot of records after the fact, but they would have been I think they would have been really something huge if they stuck together. Um, And Green Day was as soon as you saw I saw Green Day. God, 
91, I think. Well, no, 90 or 90. I saw them when they were still called Sweet Children. Uh-huh. And they would and they would come out and, and they would just blow your socks off. And they just sounded better than anyone. Like, they had the better songs. They sounded better. They'd jump all over the place. They were, even when they were just as three little kids, you know? <laughs> but you can tell, you could tell that they were just leaps and bounds better as far as, um, at least as far as, you know, pop music, they were just way ahead of everybody. But I, you know, I, I thought they were going to be like maybe as big as the replacements, you yeah. know, that's kind of yeah. what I was like, dang, if they could be as big as the replacements, that'd be pretty <laughs> cool. Or, or as big as like REM used to be, you know, like yeah. kind of an independent band, but God, they're, they're monsters now. They're huge. Right. Right. Well, that's well, like kind of like, so being in that scene and seeing these things and everyone's doing this original thing, like taking that in, like when you go back, were, were you, so you were writing your own songs at the time, presenting it to the sure. band you're with on bass, or were you just kind of taking first? Your- uh, yeah, the first band was with me and my friend Derek, and he played guitar, and he was very advanced on the guitar for yeah. his age. He was he was way ahead of everybody else, and and so we would. Um, it was sort of like when he would write something really complicated on guitar, he's like, I can't sing. So then I would write something simple on bass and I would sing and then vice versa, you know, so that it wouldn't, you know, we would have something to do. And so we would just kind of go back and forth. It wasn't really about, we weren't really writing songs. We were mm-hmm. writing music and then putting words to the music. Um, and we weren't really developing them like, <laughs> the way that I would develop songs now. It was it was more like, let's do some cool music and you have to have a singer, so someone has to sing and we'll put some words over it. It wasn't really like we well, like I would write now where I would take a lot more consideration. Um, but it was it was mostly born out of out of just playing in a room together and and kind of pointing and going, Yeah, keep doing that. That's cool. And then and then we would just go, okay, well, that's let's call that the verse. You know, that would be the way that we would write. And then later on, I, you know, when I started making stuff on my own, I would go from anywhere from, you know, here are a couple, here's a progression and a melody I have, and I don't have anything else, all the way up to here's everything. It's all written, it's all done. I just need you to come up with cool parts. Or sometimes, no, this is the main part. Like here's this little lick I wrote, and that's the main I've done it all different ways. Right. Uh just based on usually the the mood that you're in at that time, what you're seeking to do, and then also who's in the project with you, you know? Right. right. Is there like a – so that, and that sounds like the, the most like kind of comfortable development of like diving into writing. You know, like because mm-hmm. at first like it's it's such a kind of like scary thing to put yourself out there in general. And then like to be like I wrote this song about this thing to a bunch of teenagers that – you're just going to tear everything apart. That's what teenagers do. Um, but it, there's, there's a comfort within being like, here's this music and let's put something on top of that. Because like the, you know, there's like, I I don't know. I, at least I, I, for me, it was like more comforting to like write a guitar part than a lyric because it's a little less personal and a little easier for other people to interpret and understand. I, Um, yeah, I, I would, I would agree completely with that. And I think that, that it it really in 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 my instance obviously everybody has their own experience with it and it could be totally different with someone else but for in my experience it's easier yeah to write something silly it's easier to write something that you you just you know made up and don't care about it's easier to play music than to sing songs for all the things that you said it's more for the most part usually it's more you're naked more <laughs> you're exposing yeah. more yeah. And so, yeah, when I was younger, I didn't even, I didn't think about that as much, even though if you probably looked at the words, they were probably somewhat, you know, <laughs> embarrassingly uh, uh, poignant <laughs> to, to me at the point, you know, yeah, yeah. not nearly anything I would do now. I think I've gotten so much better, but, you know, that's, that's usually the exact opposite. Usually kind of people fall off as they get older. Right. And I, th- I think that's, you know, a time thing, a dedication thing, but when you really get like, in that that writing hole when you really start to focus on it you just start it starts to be obsessive and then you start to think about every line and then oh shit the melody's got to be as good as the line or whatever you know yeah. you really you yeah. start to tunnel that um yeah. so that's interesting that that that's the the uh, approach for you um so with these bands that you started cuz i dove into everything i could find on your bandcamp and like um, oh, I see. Yeah. 
so I only know what you've done with with your name. Um, but was there was there a jumping off point from the band to you started just working on your songs and doing it yourself? Yeah. So what what it was was um, David David was the guy the one yeah. that encouraged me to do it. Yeah. So. I again, for whatever reason, I I never liked the idea of being in a in a band that was sort of like you know Darwin and the Lost Causes or whatever. You know, yeah. I, I never liked I never liked that. I never have it being like a name in the so and so Tom Petty and the Harper. It worked for him, but I never saw myself like that. So I never liked that idea. I never liked being the idea of it being you know the band being called you know van halen and the guy being in a van i don't feel comfortable with that so i didn't like that but that was just me being again protective of things and trying to hide behind things and and what really happened is i was in several bands and i i i feel like those bands were kind of like going to school for me because i learned how to play in a band and i learned how to you know, work with people. And then sometimes I would play a rhythm guitar because I, the bass is, is somewhat limiting to play and sing sometimes. Um, and then uh, it just started getting to the point where I couldn't find people that would, would understand what I was looking for without me having to really, really explain it. And then I felt like that it wasn't terribly organic and it felt like I was just telling people to do and I don't like that I like it to be more collaborative and inventive and um and so I was talking to David about that this is you know 2010 and right kind of about when we first met maybe a little bit after we first met and I was telling him this and he said yeah and I said well, what's the difference you've been in these two bands uh, you know, you've been a bassist, you've been a singer, you've been, and now you're this solo guy. What's the difference? And he kind of spent a lot of time telling me the difference between them. And he said, you should try just, tr you know, you don't know, try it, try writing a record yourself. And uh, in fact, I'll produce it. And I was like, oh, well, now I can't say no. Yeah, yeah. Now I can't say no. And he said he'd play the bass. And so that made it, it really even cooler. That kinda, yeah. So it gave me, it gave me confidence to do it. You know, I was like, right. okay, well, if he's willing to put his name on it, then then I know that it must be at least good enough for him. And if it's at least good enough for him and I like it, then I don't really care if anybody else, you know, that was kind of the way I felt. And so he he uh, you know, a few of the songs on that first record are actually songs I did play in other bands. And 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 the most of them are, are original, like Britain for that record. And then for a while after that, I just felt very comfortable getting people to play things that were already sort of figured out um much like i was doing with david because at the time i was the bass player in his band oh, so okay so i would show up and he would... sorry no 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 okay. we met uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we met uh we met in el centro california uh, he was at a dj he was djing the gig and mm. i was in a band playing all love and rockets songs and I was playing uh, him in the band, and yeah, and he was and he was watching us. And about halfway through, he came up and said, uh, "Do you mind if I play with you guys?" And we <laughs> said, "Yeah, say, yeah, we'd love it if you play with you." So he took the bass, and we played uh, we played a couple songs with him, and that that's actually how how I first met him. <laughs> okay, so then so now you eventually start playing with him. And yeah, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you would come in the no, no, no. rehearsal and he, and that's where I, I, uh, Oh, well, just, just, he would come into rehearsal and say, you know, he would send us a, a text and be like, okay, we're playing these 10 songs, show up knowing these songs. Okay. And so we would show up knowing those songs and then we would rehearse maybe once or twice. That was it. Uh, one time I played with him, I never even met the drummer and guitar player. I showed up, walked on stage and we played the set. <laughs> You know, yeah, and it was because we all knew the stuff so well that we could do it. He had different people throughout the throughout the world. He'd have these guys in Portland and a guy in New York and a guy in Berlin and a guy in London. And so he could just have these people pop in and play with him. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And you could travel lightly and you could be kind of like your message and all this stuff. So I did that for quite some time. And um, and I and I liked it quite a bit and I learned a, a lot. But now I'm in a new position where I, I want to. I'm back wanting to get into the garage and, and bang around with some guys and just yeah. write it organically again, you know, cause that's so different now to me. 
like is it is it more like a distant memory type of stepping back into that or is it like more comforting yeah both i think both? i mean it, okay. i don't see it i don't see it as better or worse i just see it as different than what i'm doing and gotcha. and i'm i'm one one thing that i'm looking forward to is trying to figure out whether it still has the same mm. thing that it yeah. did once if it is it better is it worse is it different is it you know whatever yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know just, just so much of what i did before the pandemic was working either working a lot by myself uh, working in collaboration with either David or uh, my friend Julian, who produced the second record, and me and him have worked on a lot of songs, a lot of songs together. So it's either me and one other person kind of putting everything together or me. And that was really great. But then I just, I just, uh, I'm just tired of it now. <laughs> I'm just totally tired of it now. It's, I want something different. Yeah. No, I totally, I totally understand that because with, with because you bunker down and you're you're writing all this stuff and you're really getting your head to get it out and that's that's a that's a solo project you know you can't bring too many people into that until it's ready to record mm -hmm. or teach the band or whatever but like mm -hmm. and then with the pandemic on top of that you've been by yourself for a while you've been in mm -hmm. your head for a bit like <laughs> totally tired. yeah yeah and and the way that we did you know and and so the way that that night crickets happened was. Uh, so I made the first record that David produced and the first thing, you know, the first thing that I thought about the next one was, well, first I want to make another one like really fast because I was kind of in the, the feel of it. I said, but I don't want David to produce it this time. I, I want to, because again, I want to do something different. I don't like to just do the same thing. So I said, I'm going to produce it, but w would you mind still, you know, performing on it? And he said, yeah, yeah, of course. You know? So I, I wrote the tunes out. And at that time, we were uh, David gets uh, tickets to Coachella because they he's played there with with, with both of his bands, and uh, we we went there. I went with him as his guest one time, and and it's the original Violent Femmes were playing there, and and so I I you know I love that record, love Violent right. Femmes. So I I went up to see you know the Violent Femmes, and I waited till they got off the stage and. Uh, you know, Gordon and Brian kind of walked by and, and I said, hey, you know, I introduced myself to Victor. And he was like, oh, well, come sit down. And he sat oh, me down. And yeah. He said, can I get you something to drink? Can I get you something? You know, he was just like so nice. I thought, wow, this guy's so nice. What can I do for you? What can I help you with? I was like, what do you mean? What can you help me with? <laughs> I'm here to see you. You <laughs> yeah. know, you're not, you're not you're, I'm, I'm a guest, you know. And he was like, yeah, well, when we started talking, what are you doing here? Oh, my friend David. Oh, well, yeah. And I said, you know, I, this may be crazy, but I, I'm making this this EP right now, and David's playing the bass on it, and, and I need a drummer, and, and you're one of my favorite drummers. And he goes, well, send me a message. And so I sent him a message, and then that second EP was David on bass and Victor on on drums. So for me, it was like, oh wow, now I have two people that I grew up really, really admiring. They're playing, and now they're on my on my record. And then we just kept in touch. Me and Victor kept in touch throughout the the next you know i don't know eight eight or nine years or whatever and we would talk every once in a while and talk on the phone and just became friends and then right about the eh, i don't know it was 2021 so the pandemic was set in and i sent him a message and i said you know i'm starting to make some some music and i thought it'd be fun this time to kind of do something different like maybe you could just play some drums and i just try to find something to play on top of it and he said, okay, that sounds pretty cool. But he goes, I, I don't want to just, you know, just make something for one one off thing. And let's try to make something of this. And I said, oh, okay, what do you want to do? And he said, well, why don't you ask uh, David if he would if he would play with us? And I said, I don't know. You know, he's, he's playing with Bauhaus right now and they're busy and I don't know. And he goes, well, just ask him. So I asked him and and david who's you know he'll say yes to it if he's into it he says yes to so many things he's so busy <laughs> and he's like yeah yeah that sounds great well let's do one or two and see how it feels with no you know we had no uh expectations other than like well let's see what happens and so victor just recorded a bunch of drums you know different you know and he would call them things you know just make up a name for it um and he was put in a dropbox file and then one of us would either David or I would would go there and there'd be six or seven drum parts and we would just listen. And the first one that we got felt like, yeah, that's cool. We would just grab it and, and start working on it immediately. 
And there was no rules as to what you could do or not do. It was just do something and then get done and pass it on. And so it was very different. And this is stuff that David is really, really good at. Is uh, is is just in the moment, impromptu. Uh, trust yourself as an artist and not be guarded and and not be, like you said earlier, uh, going over everything ten times and, and all this. And so we start doing it, and it just like the very first one we did. It was like oh, this is incredible. Like I would I would have never added what you added. I would have never thought of that. And then it was oh, you same with you. And so we just got really quickly. We were done like eight songs, like really fast, just brrr, done. And then we're like, we want to keep going. You know, we want to keep going. And so we did a whole, the whole record. And then once that record was done, we're now seven songs in already to the new stuff. We've got seven new songs now. Nice. So yeah, we just keep, we just keep going and it's, it's very cool because, I mean, I know David, the way that he approaches it, he doesn't even listen to it until he shows up at the studio. Right. So he doesn't, crazy. he doesn't listen. And he shows up and he goes, press play. And then he's got the bass <laughs> and he's got a microphone and he's got a few things sitting around and that he might grab and shake or whatever. And he just goes and does whatever he wants over it. And he does that two or three times. And, and usually that's it. Or he'll go, okay, let me listen back. Okay, well, erase all that stuff, but that's really, you know, something like that. And a lot of times he'll just leave that to me. He'll just send me like, here's a bunch of stuff I recorded over it. What do you think? And I'll pick it and and, and move it around or, or change it. Or maybe sometimes I don't change it at all. But a key, a key to the way that we work is not spending time on it. <laughs> it's just huh. do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just do it. And then... If we go back later, we can always talk about it and critique it, but let's not critique it while we're doing it. Let's just do it and then critique it. And and that was a really way, a good way for this thing to go. And it moved really fast. And it was fun because it was something that I hadn't done before. Right. And it's almost like just playing in a way. And that's cool that it'd be like he would pitch all these ideas Right. Maybe, maybe there's like a, and send them to you or, and then you send them or however, or I guess it would go Victor to him, then to you. But like to, to take out of that chunk, there's, and if you're just kind of improving and just being in that moment, you're going to come up with something you're never going to come up or have, would have never thought of. Right. And like to mm -hmm. be able to isolate that idea or have someone else isolate that idea. Cause when you, when you're just like recording yourself, Sometimes you you come up with something cool, but you don't think it's cool, you know, because you're like absolutely ah. right. Yep. So, so like, like when when you when, so it sounds like you guys or hold on, souvenir was that the album the, or EP they recorded with you? Victor yes. And, okay. So like listening to that, that like was any of that kind of remnant of this process that became a uh, for the uh, a free society. No, no, no. Okay. Very, very different. Yeah, very different. What What happened with that is I record everything. I recorded everything to a click track. OK. And I developed. Almost all the music, not me playing at all, that different people come in and play, but we had all the music sort of around the deck. This was David's idea. David's idea was they were most of the songs were built around an acoustic guitar. And he said, let's start there. And let's just record these demos of you playing acoustic guitar to a click. And then we'll build from that demo and, and eventually strip away the, the click and strip away the, the, the acoustic guitar. And that worked really well. So when I sent it to Victor, it was pretty clear that, um, you know, like on Meaningless, I said, I, I want it to be, imagine if you're an 808, you know, I want you to make this sort of very simple repeating pattern. And then on this other one, I want, and so he was playing to, you know he was still coming up with his own parts don't don't get me wrong but he was absolutely taking a lot of direction from me and then when david played the bass he came into my studio and we talked about it and i recorded him so it was much more collaborative this one was and there was no there was no order there wasn't it went to me and then you it did there was no order it was you can do whatever you want um, the thing that we never talked about, but we ended up just doing naturally, is one person wouldn't get, you know, be greedy about it. You know, I you wouldn't you wouldn't grab a drum beat up there and go, all right, here's the bass, guitar, keyboard, and here's this cool vocal line I came up. We didn't 
we didn't really do that. It was usually, it usually went either David or I would take it first and we would add something. I, I tended, I only played bass on one of those songs because if you've got David in your band, why are you playing bass? Right, right. So, so I just kind of stayed away from that, but he happened to, he happened to have played a guitar on that song. Okay. And Which so I was, was like, well, you're, that was, um, Oh my goodness, I have to look at the list here. Uh, it was deeper on the, let me see. Oh my God, I'm sorry, my brain. Yeah, I'm working on good. these other, I'm working on these other tunes. And so it's like my brain <laughs> is thinking only those tunes now. So I'm yeah. trying to think about who, which, what are the names of those tracks on here? Um, let me find a list here. Because... That's so interesting that it's like this just fun thing you guys are passing around and just and it's really cool that because I I'd imagine as someone like uh, who spent that much time thinking about songwriting and honing the craft to receive a, a nugget and to not want to fully grow it out is like kind of holding back in a way. But also like I bet I, I imagine that holding back shows you what can blossom if someone else tinkers with it and brings it back to you. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And and, it, and this only works if you if you really, really trust the other people because right. you have to be in a situation where you you don't feel like they're they're saying that they don't like it because they didn't invent it, you know. And I've been in bands and you probably have was like, well, I don't like that. And they can't tell you why it's because they don't <laughs> they, they don't want the one person having, you know, nine ideas on the song. Because then somehow, you know, even when I was growing up, I'd be like, how do, when I was you know, really young, like, how do these bands put out these songs where it's just the singer and acoustic guitar? Like, what are the what does the drummer do? <laughs> you know, right, that's what I right, used to right. always think. I'm like, you know what? The drummer sits down and goes, Dad, you know what? This is better without the drums. And it took me years to figure that out. And these two guys already knew that they've made so many records and they've produced so many records. And they've toured the world over and over again. They've dealt with so many more people than me that they, they know how to do that already. You know, they, they're good at that. And so for me, it was just, Oh, okay. Well, I found two people that, that really, it, they do exactly what I would like to have other band members do in a band, which is I can trust them and they also inspire me. And th those are two, you know, those are two really big things. It was Ramona Clef. That was oh, the yeah. uh, okay. that was the one that he kind of came up with that really distorted wall of guitar. And so I put the bass on it. But that was the way that we would do things is just you listen to it. And part of it is when you don't sit and hammer away at lyrics for three weeks and then you present them and no one likes them when you just came up with them you're less attached so you know you're not going to fight for something that you don't that you just invented on the spot unless you think it's really great and so it kind of it kind of leads to this thing because you know i've been in bands too where it's like hey what about this and they go i don't like it hey i worked for that i worked for two months on that well who cares how long you worked on it it doesn't work right right you know, it doesn't make the idea that, you know, the more you work on something, the better it is, is, you know, sure. Yeah, that can happen. But it, the exact opposite can happen, too. So we were more of the of the idea that led, you know, led really by David in that regard of just don't, as he says, don't get precious about anything. You put it out there. We either like it or we don't. If you don't like it, hit mute. Try something else. Just go on. Move, move, move. Keep going. Keep going. And that that really works for the three of us. What a like what what a just a valuable like creative lesson in general to put it out there. Oh, yeah. You know, oh like, yeah. To yeah. be hanging out with David, like like I just even watching like the little nuggets he posts on Instagram. Like I saw one the other day, he's playing some uh he was at the Lydia, Lydia lunch thing playing the the piano on the wall. It's just like here's some dude who's just like insanely just sporadically creative but puts stuff out there and leaves it you know yes and moves on he's, because it, uh, he's an absolute um he's an absolute uh, artist in every word every sense of the word hell. and it's not it's not an instagram pose yeah. it's that's who he is i can tell you that uh, we've become very close over the years and 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 it's everything you see is that that's the way he is he loves 
He loves adventure. He loves art. He loves music. He likes landing, you know, is tired as hell and saying, we got to find the, the coolest record store in Bourbon Bar tomorrow. You know, that, that, that you know, and we got to hit that. We got to hit, you know, Charles Bukowski's cafe and, and we got to go see where Leonard Cohen used to write songs on the, on the waterfront. And, you know, he would, this is, these are the kind of things that he wants to do. Right. So he's a real, he just lives art. And, uh, and Victor's a very, very similar in the fact that he's, he's an absolute true artist in the fact that he was a, he's a very, very well known in his area, uh, actor and producer and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, he's an incredible musician. Um, and so these guys, they're very comfortable in the, in their skin. They're very, uh, you know, they've seen and heard everything. So there's just no bullshit from them. It's very much like you see what you, you, you get, what you, what you see with them. And, and we've, we've, we've created this strange little, uh, thing where we just all really get along and we all <laughs> we all really enjoy working with each other and and we love we love waking up like victor says every morning is like christmas morning when you know someone's going to be putting something in the dropbox and you're like literally have no idea what's going to be there <laughs> you know yeah, it was yeah it's kind of cool all of a sudden you put, oh oh there's a, there's a violin on there okay <laughs> cool i didn't you know i would have never thought that and and it's very cool um Almost all the decisions that we made, we just were like, cool, that sounds great. <laughs> That's, but you know, like, it's kind of how it should be. Like, it should but just it's be, rare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy rare. that it's rare. You know, it's crazy that the, the fun, creative aspect of it. And maybe I, if, what a cool situation you found yourself in with these two, like, giants in their field and who are just like the real deal artist like uh figures because like sometimes you see like people who work so hard to develop this this thing that they are but there's not that same creative like just spirit running through them so to have Absolutely. like yeah. two two guys that you're in a group with and you get to do you get to do the work with like you're doing the work yeah. with them that's so cool yeah. no it, it really really is because i've i have i've i've worked with david that way um Many times, you know, I've worked with him as co-collaborators, co-producers. I've, I've been his bassist. I've been, you know, his sound man. Like, kind of whatever you want me to do, David, I can do it. You know, if I can do it, I'll do it kind of thing. Um, so I've been through all those different things. But this is truly uh, each one of us, I would say, you know, if you were to ask them, you know, do you feel like there's a pecking order? Or I, I, I think we'd all say no. I think we would all say that we all understand what we all bring to it. it. It's just, we all have a different thing that we bring to it. And, and we all have the ability to respect that. I think, um, obviously for me, it's, I think much easier to respect them sure. <laughs> you know, because they have, a, they have a catalog for them to, to give me that respect means a lot. Yeah. Um, because they, you know, why would they, if they didn't have, you know, they don't have to, they certainly don't have to. So they're doing it by choice. Um, but you know, we all, we all kind of say the same thing over, which is respect, respect the work, respect the song, respect the album, respect the art, that type of thing. So any, any critique, or if I say, I don't like your part, David, it's because I think it doesn't help the song and right. it's nothing, nothing to do about whether I think, you know, David gave me a bad look the other day or something. We don't do that kind of bullshit, which is, which is really nice. Cause I have been in bands where it's like, well, I'm kind of mad at you right now. So I'm going to hate your part for a couple of weeks, you know? That's right, really, right. really productive. Oh yeah, that brings the best records. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how the Ramones did it, but they did. It. But like, yeah, yeah, that's well. And what's really cool from you're just getting the art. You're not even getting. I mean, the person mm -hmm. is the art, but when you when you open that file, that's that's what you're getting. You're just getting the part. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. uh, like, that, that's um, that's so cool, man. Like, I I don't know, like this whole like a. Uh, a free society diving into this record. It's just so like, it's so awesome on every aspect of it. And like for me, I've been going through this record over and over and over again. And it's been an honor the the chat with you and David and Vincent and kind of like hear how this whole thing, like kind of came together from all these different angles yeah. and like, but how the through line is that, that, um, 
ode to the the like sporadic moment, the beauty within yes. the, the split the, that fades away as soon as you look away, like and respecting that and really trying to honor those little nuggets that are captured. Um, on a before because I I only got a couple minutes left with you and I yeah, really appreciate yeah. your time. One one question with a fadeaway girl. Um, did you play sitar on that? No, okay. that's my friend uh, yeah. Chris Vibberts. Yeah, he's he's a very good player, and yeah, he uh, he's, he's a good track. He he went to he went to Berkeley School of Music, and he uh, he can play he can play. I, I mean, I don't even know how many instruments he can play. He could probably play twenty or something instruments. It's, that's who he is. You can just he's one of those guys. He uh, he's a guy that lives. He now lives in Portugal, but he lived in in my area and he was in bands around where I was in bands and. Um, he was uh i recommended him to play in the um david j and the gentleman thieves band because we already had a four piece that was sort of the rock you know two guitars bass drums but we really wanted this auxiliary person and so i recommended chris and he was perfect so he joined us and he played flute sitar keyboards guitar penny whistle <laughs> I mean, yeah. he was just that guy that was over yeah. in the corner that had like 10 things that would like shake a shaker and you know, whatever, but it was really great to have him because he was so, he could just jump between the instruments. Um, and that was just one of those things where I knew, I knew that song had to have a sitar. And I don't know why, but I was like, it needs to have a sitar. And I just told him, I gave him a few songs. I can't even remember what they were, but I gave him a few songs that I liked the sitar on. And then that's just basically all him. He just went and banged it out. Was it? It fits so well. Mm -hmm. he, like with a, a free society, there's a lot of that like drone that maybe that uh, fadeaway girl kind of like had within its own like uh, uh, chord progression. Like where I think a lot of that Eastern like influence or the instrumentation really would stick out or fit well. Yeah, that was the all that sort of droney stuff is this little box that David has. And it just basically drones and, and you, you, you know, you slide it around and pick the, the, the pitch you want and, and, um, and you start, you, you jam over it, but it's, it's, it was something again, that he would just, sometimes he would hear it on the song. Oh, let's put that in there. And he would just let it, that'd be one track where that would just be running through it. And um, so sometimes, you know, it would be, we used everything exactly the way that he played it or exactly the way that Victor played it. And sometimes we would cut it in half. Sometimes I would take the end of the beat and put it at the beginning or, you know, I, it was really more about just like taking it to where that song really wanted to be. Um, and that was, you know, that's tough because three of us are going to have three different ideas of where that song wants to be. But for the most part, you know, once somebody puts something in, on top of it because you know there's no there's no melody there's no notes there's no key there's no nothing so you know the first thing you put in all, all of a sudden it's it's just changed drastically so you if, if david would drop a drone and a bass line and then he'd be done with it for the first round it's like okay so now i got a drum beat i got a bass line maybe the bass line isn't even right it's just him playing like five bass lines and you know pick the ones you like and the drone you know, okay let's use this with two of those bass lines and the drone. Now, what can I add to this? Okay. And then it was my turn. Right. Well, you know, so yeah, it cool. was really fun. It was really fun that way um, to, to do it. And then Victor would be like, Hey, my friend's over last night. Look at this. It's a great, he played trumpet and we huh. put that on, Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, that's, that, that's so. so, that's so cool. Cause like you're, you're taking the tonal center almost. And like, depending on what, which baseline you went with really defined what, tonal center that was it's like it's like a yes. fun a fun math problem in a way at that point like yeah that's cool and it's just like what does it put in mind like when you right. when you hear that when I, I would just turn it on it was like what does it put in mind and the way i have my setup here is you know i'll flick everything on so i'm very close to a number of instruments and soft a soft sense i like i have a number of things around me that i can just touch and they're ready to go so you know you just sit there and you just start playing and you're just clicking on noises and not like something or or you go, no, that needs to have that kind of sound of guitar. And then you just go do that. You know, you you don't think about it. You just do it because you can always come back. You're never going to hear that thing for the first time again, ever. So why not get that initial thing first? 
because you're always going to be able to go back and listen to it. Right. Right. And you know, get that thing first. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the build off, like it just having whatever there ready to go makes it so much more of an option. You know what I mean? Like there's something to a a guitar being out of the case or the, the, the synth being turned on when you turn on the light, you know what I mean? Just whatever it is, if it's on ready to roll, it's no, what I found out was at the, when the pandemic started and I was sitting in this room a lot more than I was before. Yeah. Um, I realized that I was, and it's kind of embarrassing, but it's, you know, it happens to be true is that I would not choose to use things because they weren't plugged in. I'd be yeah. like, well, <laughs> yeah. that amp is, this, that amp would be so perfect. I've got this box amp. I was like, oh, that box amp would be perfect. But I'll just use the other one because it's not plugged in. It's like, no, that's <laughs> stupid. They need to all be ready to roll or why yeah. you have that. Oh, I totally, I totally understand that. Darwin, thank you so much for your time, man. This has been a fun chat. Um, Absolutely, man. I, I appreciate you taking the time and, and as always into the music. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. And your your solo work is wonderful too. Like David definitely saw what what I don't know what we all need someone to believe in us to make us go, but he definitely saw something good because I I've enjoyed your work as well. And diving into this the night crickets, I'm really excited to hear this new batch of tunes, man. That's super cool. Oh yeah. Well, please, uh, please stay in touch because, um, you know, we'll be able to, you know, share that with you. And then obviously if you're a fan, I'd love to share it with you. Well, thank you, man. I definitely am a fan and I will, I'll, uh, we'll, t- we'll circle back when the next batch is ready and then I'll bug you some more. Okay. Thank you so much. And if you need anything or follow up, just let me know. All right. All right. We'll do. Thanks Darwin. You have a good okay. evening. You too. Bye. Bye. Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig of the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.